Hey everybody, welcome. I know this is very unusual, but here we are in these pandemic times. We gotta get creative. And this is our uh, first ever virtual kickoff to a football season. I'm Josh Lewin, the voice of the Bruins. Can't thank you enough for joining. We should have a lot of fun over the next hour or so, get you to talk to or with, or at least hear from a lot of the, the key people regarding UCLA football. And uh, it, it should be a good time. Hopefully, obviously the season is a great time in what again are very unusual circumstances, but we're gonna do what we all have to do. Speaking of unusual circumstances, uh, you get a new athletic director in here, he's got a socially distance from everyone. Uh, it's been a very odd thing for sure, but let's hear from the new AD. We're so fortunate to have him, Martin Jarman. Bruins, my name is Martin Jarman and I'm your athletic director and I want to welcome you to the kickoff dinner virtually this year. I know it's been a crazy year, but we are excited about the football season. Thank you so much for your support of our young men and young women. Enjoy this evening. I look forward to meeting all of you at some point and go Bruins. Martin, thank you very much. We're going to dive right in and start talking to some of the key people around the UCLA football program. We'll hear from coaches. We'll hear from players. We're going to start on the defensive side of the ball. Jerry Azanero, of course, is an accomplished coach that for UCLA is the head man on the defensive side. Last year, the Bruins were a, a work in progress in that area, but Jerry dug in deep. He helped the guys make progress and mature, and he's back to finish the job that he started here in 2020. So we'll get you to that interview right now. Coach Jerry Azanero, so nice to have him with us here, too. And uh, obviously, a, a lot to get through here, Coach, on, on your side of the ball. But, but first, you've been with Coach Kelly for many years. I'm not asking you to spill state secrets or anything, but since we're going to be talking to him later, what don't the fans see with Chip? What, what don't they know? Because you've gotten to know him so well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they, they see everything. I mean, it, Chip's not one of those guys that's... Uh, you know, got things that he's hiding or anything like that. I mean, he is, he is who he is. He's upfront. He's brutally honest. He's wildly, wildly intelligent. And uh, I mean, that's what you get every, get every day. You get the same guy every day. Is that part of why you always seem to, to want to make sure you are where he is? I mean, I would think that you want to put people in your life that are like that. And uh, you guys seem to make a great team together. But do you draw from Chip some things for yourself? Oh, without a doubt, I think, you know, anytime you're, you know, around elite performers or people that have been very, very successful in their field and you're learning every single day. So uh, uh, when you get to be my age, you know, you try to you try to really expand, you know, the wealth of knowledge and he provides that uh, on a daily basis. So, yeah, absolutely. You've got knowledge to impart to your wisdom here now, I would think gives you some hope that this year's defense is ready to take a leap forward in production and performance. What are you seeing so far on the on the practice field that makes you think that there are going to be leaps taken forward here in 2020? Yeah, I, you know, the, that word leaps kinds of frightens me a little bit. You know, I, I, what is really encouraging is just the way they've focused on day to day. You know, and I think that's really, really important when you're dealing with a, a group of young guys and there's a bunch of stuff going on uh, in our universe right now, you know. So uh, to see these guys come in here every single day and just, uh, you know, day by day, day by day. And uh, it's really been a pleasure to be around them, to be honest with you. Who are some of the names that the fans should know besides the ones we got to, to see play last year? We're not going to be able to be around practice personally, some of us, mm -hmm. and uh, so we kind of look to you guys to whisper in our ears about, hey, look out for this guy, look out for this guy, without leaving anybody out, which is difficult, I know. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you had to pick through a, a bunch of guys that you're just so excited about to, to have in 2020, who are some of those guys? Well, you know, first off, I'm, I'm excited to be around them all, to be honest with you. Like, like I said earlier, it's a, it's a really, really good group that has been able to focus and, uh, you know, just 
kind of come in here with a, a happy attitude, you know, which is which is part of the part of the deal. Uh, you know, Quentin Lake is going to do what he does on, on a regular basis. Uh, having Bo Calvert to be able to go through training camp and be able to, you know, to learn on the coach Pelham has been unbelievable. Uh, Tyler Manoa has done a really, really fine job. Coach Nansen joined us uh, from USC and uh, he's coaching those guys and he's done a, a wonderful job with those guys. I mean, just a, just a wonderful job. So uh, uh, some of the young guys, you know, they, they're coming along uh, and it's because not, it's not because of lack of effort. You know, they do a great job uh, just working on a regular basis. Uh, Jay Shaw's done a really, really good job. So we're getting there. Yeah, we're getting there. Last one for you, Coach. Uh, I asked you about Chip, but but who are some of your other mentors and uh, I guess football heroes as you became a coach? Who are the people that shaped your opinions and your your strategies? Not even your football strategies, but your life strategies. Who would you shout out? Yeah, you know, it's been uh, it's been kind of a a, a unique uh, journey for me because you know I started in really really small college football, so. I, it wasn't like, you know, I had the opportunity to work for a man like Bill Parcells or anything like that. So, um, you know, guys that I would say who really shaped me, you wouldn't know them, even though they probably are some of the, the winningest and the best football coaches that you've ever been around. You know, there's a man named Alex Roscoe, who's now the head coach of a high school in Maine, who's won four state championships in Maine and four state championships in Massachusetts. He was the head coach of a Division two college that I was at. I mean, those kind of guys have really uh, shaped you know, what I've done uh, on, on the pro level. Chip and I were together in Philly and obviously and together in San Francisco and together at Oregon. So uh, I, I would say that he's probably had the biggest influence later on in my life. But some of those small college guys, uh, they, they, they kind of influenced me the most. Coach, just keep uh, bringing your wisdom and, and your great attitude. We'll see you soon enough. Stay safe and go Bruins. Yeah, God bless. Thanks. Beautiful late afternoon in the shadow of the San Gabriels, the picturesque Rose Bowl. It's a UCLNA are running across the field now from right to left as we see it. And the Bruins are right behind, uh, launching to the near side, looking for Phillips, diving, end zone, touchdown, UCLA! What a pass, what a catch, what a first half from Pasadena. Big time hit. UCLA Thompson Robinson takes the home run shot for Ethan Burnett! Touchdown, UCLA! What a moment! Well, you know, this season wouldn't be the same without the help from our friends from the sideline. Let's bring him out best we can for you anyway. Here comes the Spirit Squad. Right, getting right back into it now. You know, we started talking defense with Coach Jerry Azanero. Want to stay on that side of the ball with two key members of that unit. Safety, Quentin Lake. Defensive lineman, Osa Odigizua. We'll get to them right now. All right, let's start with Osa. Let's go with Osa Odigizua, only because I got to practice saying that name over and over and over so I don't mess it up like I usually do on, on the air. Uh, and mm -hmm. I had a lot of opportunities to do that last year, Osi, because you led the Bruins in tackles for loss last year. Do you feel like that's just a jumping off point for you? I guess the question is how high can you fly in, in 2020? 
Uh, I feel like it's definitely something that I'm not satisfied with. So definitely a jumping off point. I feel like something that I can improve on indeed in 2020. And that's always just our goal yearly is to improve. What's the, the camaraderie like in your position group? How come you guys have bonded so well? Um, I feel like we spend a lot of time together. You know, we actually get along super well. And just being able to spend time with each other outside of the building and just in a football related way and just find things to do that don't have anything to do with football, just get to know each other and really be involved in each other's lives, you know? I don't have to tell you how difficult it's been during the pandemic. I mean, we've all got our own stories and, and things that we, we actually are, are grateful for that, you know, it's not as bad as it could be for a lot of us. But I, I'm wondering now that it's here, now that there's finally going to be football for you, is it the, the kind of thing where you, you look back and you say, man, we, you know, we really did a lot of things to get ready for this. So I'm extra excited to get out on the field. Indeed. I feel like over the pandemic, I was just trying to use the time to get ahead and just learn and just progress as much as possible because I know that we don't all have the same opportunity. So I was just trying to take advantage of any opportunity that I had to get better and use it to get ahead. A lot of Bruins fans know that you, your brother was here before you were, obviously did some nice things here for sure. Uh, update us on your brother, if you don't mind. How's he doing? Does he still peek in at UCLA football every Saturday? I, I assume just to watch you, if nothing else. Yeah, we talk a lot. You know, uh, he's definitely going to be tuning in to all my games this year and just helping me review and study and get better as the season goes on. Still takes interest in UCLA football in that regard. He's doing well. He's back at home with my family. So in a good place. And, you know, back home, for people that don't know, you're an Oregon guy this year. There actually is a trip to Oregon, and everybody kind of thinks it's funny. You know, a lot of Oregon people that grew up where you grew up and when you grew up, they just want to go play for Chip Kelly. And here you are playing for Chip Kelly. It's just down, down here in Westwood and Pasadena. Uh, it's, it's funny how life works, man. <laughs> Indeed. That's for sure. So one more for you as a, a state wrestling champion back in Oregon. I've always wondered how those skills translate to football. And, and do you miss competitive wrestling? Uh, I definitely do. I feel like that would have been fun to be able to do or maybe be a two-sport athlete. But at the same time, I feel like football is where I was more willing to invest everything that I had. Not to say that I didn't in wrestling, but I feel like this is something I have more of a passion for. And UCLA is my dream school. So... I wasn't, I wasn't really feeling any type of way that they didn't have a wrestling team. I was all in the football. And I feel like it's helped me a lot just with my hands and footwork, just keeping good feet and good balance helps a, a ton in the trenches. Well, keep doing what you do, man. Thanks so much for joining us and go Bruins. Thank you. Where's up? All right, let's jump now to the uh, always upbeat, always smiling Quentin Lake. See, told you. Uh, I, I gotta say, I, you know, when I found out that you had this elementary school picture and prediction that I will have graduated from UCLA and I will be a professional football player. I will have three kids and live mm -hmm. in LA. It seems like all that's lining up pretty well. I know that last part, not quite yet, but, yeah. uh, it's coming along, isn't it? Yeah. The, um, the first two are coming along real well. Um, I graduate, I'm expected to graduate this fall, so that's going to be fun. And then, you know, professional playing in uh, the NFL has always been a dream of mine, um, you know, and I feel like I can do that, especially with, you know, they, them giving us a free season. Um, so, yeah, I've always been, you know, a hard worker. My dad's been a big influence for me. So, you know, those two um, things that I said in that little Instagram post um, are coming to fruition. So I'm happy about that. I love that. Why, why are you so excited? I'm asking everybody this, but, but why are you so excited about what could be in 2020 for the team? Um, I'm excited because, you know, we've been through a lot. I think this team has been, you know, through its ups and downs. Um, as a team, I think we're coming together really as a whole. Um, you know, it's not necessarily there's any, you know, divide within the team. I think we all can gel really well. So I think that's the biggest thing for us is that, you know, we all see us see each other as brothers. That's the biggest thing. Um, you know, whenever we need support or something off the field or even on the field, um, you know, we can get it to the guys. And I think that's the biggest thing is that we're really coming together as a team. Tell us about Brian Norwood and the difference he makes, a position coach now that obviously knows his football, but just a good guy, right? I mean, I know he gets you guys out in the community doing things of service. I love that. 
Yeah. So the biggest thing for me about Coach Norwood is that he is understanding. He coaches every player um, differently in, in its own way. It's not like he coaches every player the same and uses, you know, it's not his way or the highway. You know, he's he's very understanding when it comes to football and even um, stuff after football. And like you mentioned, him being in the community, that was a big thing for me. Um, he came up to me with a couple opportunities. And I thought that was um, very important for even me as a player and him as a coach to you know, get there in, uh, in the community and, you know, talk to some of the kids, some of the families, you know, in lower income areas. And I think that was really important. So as a coach, um, I really appreciate what he's doing. Um, I would definitely say he's, you know, one of the better coaches I had in terms of, you know, being a coach and almost like a, a father figure, not necessarily, but, you know, in that type of realm um, as a person, but he's a great man. You know, I really respect him. So you mentioned the word father. I got to ask you about your dad. I mean, you get it all the time. You have a famous dad. That's just always a question on the list. But do you feel like you're carving out your own space now? You're not Carnell Lake's kid anymore, but you're, you're you. It's funny. It's funny that you mentioned that. I used to get that a lot when I was first here. My first two years, it was always, you know, Carnell son this, Carnell son that. And now I did appreciate it because, you know, it kind of put a, a, a little fire a little fire behind me. Um, not necessarily that I'm making my own path, you're right. You know, I don't hear it as much. You know, it's still there here and there from fans and stuff like that. You know, your dad was a great player. You know, I, I, want, you, I want you to be like your dad and stuff like that. But, you know, I don't hear it as much, which I kind of like because it's like I'm, I'm getting my own respect. That's the biggest thing for me is I wanted my own respect. Yes, I know my dad was a great player. I see it all the time. I see it in the building. You know, he's in the UCLA Hall of Fame. And I get that. But I think me carving out my own path and, you know, people talking less about him when it comes to me, I think it's, you know, it's a sign of respect. I got to ask you one final thing, because what always sticks with me about you when you first got to campus, I'm leafing through the media guide and it says your favorite player growing up. I'm thinking, oh, I can finish this sentence. It's going to be Cornell Lake. Is that yeah. Rod Woodson? I did. So, <laughs> tell me about that. I love that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, obviously, uh, you know, I love my dad. I love his play style. Um, I know, you know, he was one of my favorite players growing up. But, you know, I didn't necessarily want that to be my fav favorite player. And when I saw my dad playing, you know, in it was 85 or 88 or, you know, 89, 90, you know, those years when he was on the Steelers in his prime years, I saw Rod Whitson playing with him. And I always because I was a corner in high school. So, you know, growing up being a corner, um, you know, I was like, OK, you know, who? was one of the best corners in the league during the time when my dad played and it was Rod Woodson. And he told me all these stories about how Rod Woodson was a hard worker and how he did all these things off the field. And I kind of, you know, was like, you know, maybe, you know, looking at how he played and him being in the Hall of Fame and all that, I was like, yeah, that, you know, that could be my favorite player. And it eventually, eventually was. And I, I love and respect for Rod Woodson. I met, I met him a couple of times when he was over at UCLA, when he was coaching. And, you know, he's a great man too. So, you know, nothing but respect for him. Respect for you, my man. Go get them. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Now from on the field to off the field, let's get you to a little behind the scenes of what happens with the booth. Uh, the guys that are with me every Saturday. And, and thank you guys so much, by the way, for uh, tuning us in on KLAC or wherever you happen to be. Uh, the Bruins games come to you with a lot of hard work from a lot of people. It's, it's certainly not just me. I don't even work that hard. But uh, let's get you to the rest of the brothers in the band here. Let's talk to Matt Stevens and Wayne Cook. So we've got the broadcast team all together at the very least, kind of. It's all virtual, as we know. But Matt Stevens and Wayne Cook, we're all together now for, seems like, I don't know, about 80 years, guys. But really, this is year, uh, what is this, year five for us? Four or five, something like that. Uh, Matt, what have you been doing to stay busy? Uh, that, that's my first question for you. Uh, a lot of walks, uh, a lot of jogs. You know, I've been working out on the lawn a lot and uh, a lot of home time, getting to know my family really well. And I've actually enjoyed it. So uh, it's been uh, nice being home with them. Uh, obviously, I want the world to go back to normal and uh, everybody feel better. Uh, but it has been very different. Let's go to our other Bruin Rose Bowl quarterback. Wayne Cook is coming to us from his classroom. So I know kind of what you do in your spare time, teaching America's youth, which is a very important thing indeed. How, how is that going? Well, they're taking a test right now while I'm doing this. So that's, that's, it's exciting stuff. Everything has changed, but you can, you can tell if you look over my shoulder, my love for the Bruins does not go far. I, I bring it with me everywhere I go. Let's go uh, lightning round here, fellas. Matt Stevens, I'm going to start with you. What, what is the biggest strength 
What is the biggest concern for this year's Bruins team? Well, I think the strength is the defensive line. You have a lot of juniors, seniors, experience coming back, and they're going to have to carry that defense because uh, the concern is the young uh, linebackers that UCLA is going to have. Uh, Bull Calvert's going to be back, and you know we're going to see Lenny Tolaloa, but a lot of new faces on that defense. Carl Jones had a good year last year. I expect a lot from him. And the biggest concern, too, is find that edge rusher who can get after the passer. That's going to be a, a real concern, I'm sure, for that uh defense of Chip Kelly's uh, to put pressure on the passer and that'll take the pressure off the secondary. You mentioned a little bit of what happened last year. I want to kind of pick up on that thread with you, Wayne. Uh, What are your takeaways from last year? What do you best remember about last season? Well, I remember that when UCLA is on, it's, it's on. And, And then when it was off, it was off. So, you know, we've played some pretty challenging schedules the last few years. Uh, winning four Pac-12 games um, and had some amazing moments. But one thing I, I always think about is, you know, UCLA has been young. Since Co- Coach Kelly took over, this has been a young squad. And as Matt pointed out, other than linebacker, the defensive front is experienced. There's, there's players all over this field that we've seen. So to me, I look at a team that's got a lot of reps, shown that they can be good taking their lumps and we learn from those. And so I'm just excited in the progress they're making. And let me stay on that, if you don't mind, Wayne, with you, because it seems like almost as usual, the pundits might be uh, Uh, slow to the take, right? I mean, we feel very good about this Bruins team. Why are people sleeping on this year's team, do you think? First of all, you know, who cares, right? The pundits, whatever. It is what it is. I I love this idea that, that, you know, UCLA has taken on Anybody and everybody. The schedules are tough every year. It gets them battle tested. I've heard Coach Kelly talk about that before. I love the idea that that UCLA brought in uh, Paul Groton, who's an offensive lineman, uh, Obi uh, Ebo, uh, uh, Quantrez Knight, um, Britton Brown. These are four graduate transfers that are players that were good where they were at before. These aren't guys that just you know didn't play and showed up. These are guys that have stats behind them and they're experienced. They're grown men. Okay. So when I look at this squad right now, I see tons of guys of experience. I see some new guys that are adding in some experience and we're, we're older. This is not freshmen and sophomores running around. And if they are a sophomore, they're probably a red shirt sophomore like Bo Calvert, right? Who mm-hmm. looks like a man. I like, this is a man's game. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. And I'm going to throw this out there too. And I, I know we don't have too much time. Dorian Thompson Robinson's in his third year. Experience shouldn't be an issue anymore at the quarterback position. So that excites me as well. Matt Stevens, same uh, question for you. What do you think? Uh, You know, I'm excited to see Dorian Thompson Robinson tell you the truth. He's had so many reps uh, where I think now he's put everything sort of together and he's going to play a more disciplined game, make better decisions. And uh, I think they're going to be smart decisions. And when you have that many reps, and you're going into your junior season, that's such a benefit. A lot of times, you know, in the past, you had to wait to play till you were a junior and senior. Uh, You didn't have all that experience. Uh, So I'm really excited to see how much he's grown. Uh, I've been following him on Twitter. Uh, He's very, you know, up on this year, his teammates, uh, very positive. And I think you need to be that way when you're a quarterback. Matt, staying with you for a second, you know, Brian Norwood comes in to help out uh, the coaching staff on the defensive side. Everybody's super excited about that. For the most part, there's continuity, though, with this coaching staff. How important is that in college football to, to have continuity year after year? Uh, I mean, it's, it's very important. Just ask Josh Rosen, who had three different offensive coordinators during his you know, years at UCLA. And you begin to understand the schemes, what you want to do, and then you can tweak it if you're a coach. Once a player has been in your system for a few years, uh, you can say, all right, we're going to do this a little bit different. And now that player has an understanding because he has a base. So having all the continuity with this coaching staff is really going to benefit this team. Wayne Cook, for you, you're you're not going to be right down on the sidelines this year because of COVID, uh, new rules that we're all dealing with. What are you going to miss most about that assignment? Gosh, everything. I, I, the, the roar of the crowd. I, I'm going to be honest, and I, I mean this with all my heart. I love walking around the sidelines of the Rose Bowl, and I have people from all over the stadium that, that want to talk, that want to hang out. Hey, Cook, what do you, what do you think? I'm going to miss that. I, I miss my friends. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, 
there's a lot of people down there that I really look forward to seeing. And then going on the road in a hostile environment, I, I'm, I'm just thinking about it. It's kind of making me sad. Um, but, hey, I'm just happy we have football. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy for that. Yeah, I'm going to miss you almost throwing down with some of those ushers trying to get around in your, your UCLA wear. That's true. So, uh, for, for both you guys to finish up here, uh, th there are obviously returning people, personnel that we're all excited about. We've talked about some of them. Which newcomers are you most excited to see, Matt? I mean, it's not just freshmen, but I mean, uh, Wayne hit on it a little bit. There are some transfers into the program. Who are guys that we aren't really talking about yet that you're excited to see wearing Bruin colors? You know, uh, last fall, we went out, Wayne and I, and we watched Keegan Jones play, and he ended up redshirting last year. Uh, but there were things about him when he has the football in his hands that are special, where you're like, whoa, wow. And that's an amazing play. So, uh, and it's going to be interesting, too, because there's so many tailbacks. I mean, Demetric Felton's obviously going to be the star. Uh, Wayne mentioned Brown, but who's going to be that tailback? And I'm excited to see Keegan Jones and see what he can do. Wayne, do you have thoughts? Well, I, I agree with, with Keegan. I think that's a great point because, you know, in listening, we thought he was going to do more last year. But he even admitted he may not have been quite ready. You know, watching the interviews, he's like, you know, he needed to become more comfortable with the system. It goes back to our last question. Players, you know, without a spring ball this year, having players that have been around the program for a while with the same coaches really helps. But I'm going to go – I'm going to name names that, that we do know. Because I, I, I'm going to go with the big guys up front on both sides. Sean Ryan, with Penny Sewell opting out at Oregon, has a chance to be the, le the best left tackle in the conference. I, 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 I like watching really good offensive linemen, and otherwise I don't want to watch you at all. So I want to watch Sean Ryan. I, I look forward to this. On the other side of the ball, uh, Mr. Odigi Zua. And I know he's getting a lot of hype, but we need quarterbacks of opposing teams to fear somebody. Someone that draws double teams on a regular basis that helps everybody out. So I'm going to focus on the, the front side of, of the offense and defense. And those are my two stars. My two stars are Wayne Cook and Matt Stevens. Thank you guys <laughs> very much. It's going to be weird not going out for postgame tacos and beer with you on, on the road. But we'll uh, we'll figure out a way to do that anyway. And, and appreciate you guys as always. I can't Josh, wait to hang out again, Josh. Yep. All right, okay. Well, again, thanks so much to Matt and Wayne for their time. Next up, we're going to go offensive side of the ball, talk to offensive coordinator and offensive line coach Justin Fry. And, hey, when your guys go up to Pullman and, and drop a 67 on the scoreboard, things must be going reasonably well on the offensive side of the ball. So let's get to the interview with Coach Fry. Well, Coach Fry, you got to be excited, as we all are, that uh, it's finally here, getting ready now for actual kickoff and we can talk in theory and you know through pandemics and all of that but just to get out on the field and uh see you know one uniform against the other how excited are you for for that simple thing uh it's great it's what the kids work for you know i mean we're they're training and lifting and running all year so that you can come in and, and play the game so for us to know that there's a little light at the end of the tunnel now that's that's just fun to be back out doing what we want to do as coaches and what the kids want to do as players is play the game you know, you've got a unique perspective on Martin Jarman since you were at Boston College when he was at Boston College. What, what did you like about BC athletics and, and what, if anything, uh, have you borrowed to bring here yourself? Well, I think just when you say Martin, the first thing that comes to mind is like when he walks in, you can his energy is palpable for the student athletes. You know, um, he's got a athletic directors wear a lot of hats. They have a lot of jobs and things that they're in charge of. But one of the ones that he always puts on is the ambassador for the kids. And so that, I remember that the, the barbecues and the energy and excitement he had around the kids when he first got there, like I said, it was just palpable. You could taste it. Um, you know, he also came into like any place like this place where there's a history and excitement around it. He's not going to try to rebrand and change everything. It's going to be enhanced and supplement and build, you know, so those just I was there, you know, six, eight months with Martin. But that's what I took a lot from him. Um, was that energy and excitement to, to be a catalyst for things and not just, you know, a, a restart. Um, and then the BC itself, I mean, the, the, the unique thing about that place was, you know, it, it's a Catholic Jesuit school. And so they, their big motto was, you know, service men and women for service for others. Um, and a lot of people, I think they pay, they'll pay a keynote speaker to come in and speak to an organization or, or a firm to come in and talk about those things. And that was in the forefront. That was every day. So uh, probably just a big life lesson slash coaching thing that really kept that with me is that's, 
you got to pump that into your unit, you know, so I get to do that to the offensive side of the ball. I get to do that to the offensive line. And it's really good that keeping that in the forefront of their mind too. Like we have, as we've seen in 2020, a huge platform for change and for success and to make things go. And so service for others has to be one of those because you just, we got to make things better. Um, and so taking that from there and coming here, that's more in the daily mantra for me in a meeting room than probably it was before when I got there. And you're in charge of the one unit that really speaks to that. I mean, it, the offensive line is five guys working as one. That's what it comes down to. It's kind of the ultimate example of teamwork in, in sports, I would think. Uh, yes. I mean, it's, you know, they're the nameless guys. It's the unit. And that's how we like it. I mean, you got good players and guys going to have success. And I've had draft picks and we've had people go on to play success. But it really, you know, individual honors come with, with unit and team success. Um, and so, you know, I, not really a secret, I don't think more than just it's it's a hard task is it's really about three things, right? You, you've got to believe in what you're selling and believe in the, the where you're headed. The kids do and the coach does, right? And then you have to demand that every day. That's got to be demanded every day. You can't, that can't be a sometime thing. It's an all the time thing. And then you have to go live it every day. So you can't just demand it and speak about it and then let things go by the wayside. So for an offensive line unit, that's what you have to do. Whatever scheme you're in, whatever, you know, technique that you're into, that's the best technique for us. And here's why. And everybody's bought into that. So then you're vested in that. And then now they can demand it from each other for the accountability point and then they can go execute it. So that's that's kind of what it's got to be. You know? Yeah. So with all that stated, how gratifying is it when an offensive line is able to block and block so well for big money backs, the guys that do get the glory? I mean, Joshua Kelly and now Demetrius Felton, there are some good names to know. Yeah, well, it would, like those two names you say, the, the good part is those are great kids. So you want to do that for those guys, right? Because good things happen to good people that work hard. That's just plain and simple, you know, whether it's football or life or whatever, right? And so you talk about two great kids to start with. You want to do it for those guys, you know, and, and multiple guys and all the skill guys. Um, but they'll go as far, they'll be as dynamic as we get them started because we're the catalyst. We've got to be on the same page and doing that. So I think the chemistry, I think the accountability then starts with the room and the unit and then grows to the team through us. Yeah, it feels really good when they score and they come back and give you a high five, right? You learn that as a fourth grader when you start as an offensive lineman. Your name's not going in the paper unless you give up a sack, right? Unless you miss a key block. When other people's names are going in the paper, that's good. But that's good for the team, and, and that's okay. Virtual high five. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate Thank it. You. Go get them this weekend. All right. Take care. All right. All right, let's get you back from the coaches to the players. I want everybody to hear from the guys that will actually make it happen with the football in their hands. A dynamic duo, number one and number 10, in your game program, together they accounted for 32 touchdowns between them last year. They're together right here for us now. Dorian Thompson-Robinson and Demetri Felton. Well, let's start with the quarterback. Let's start with DTR. Got to ask you, how are things different compared to last year for you physically and mentally? Why do you think you're in such a, a good place right now? Yeah, man, I think just being able to have some time to myself, um, you know, really get to find myself, really get to hone in on my own uh, individual skills, um, as well as just being able to connect with uh, my teammates in a different way. Uh, all that put together, I think, really has made me a complete person, a complete quarterback, um, and something I think I'm really going to show on uh, November 7th. When you talk about complete quarterbacks, who are some of the guys that you look around at and go, yeah, I, I like that guy, even when you were growing up? I mean, who who kind of jumped out at you? It's like, that's that's the way I want to do it. Yeah, um, I know. I'd say definitely Aaron Rodgers. That's definitely a, a guy that I always look at in terms of film and, and breaking down stuff and stuff like that. So definitely him. Of course, Tom Brady, one of the greats. And uh, guys like Dak Prescott and, and some of the newer guys like uh, Lamar Jackson and Deshaun Watson are some of the guys I definitely look up to as well. Those are great names. So I, I got to ask you this question. How gratifying was that game in Pullman last year? And how often have you watched the replay? Because if I'm you, I probably watch that thing every morning just from like motivation, you know? Yeah, man. Uh, you know, I'm definitely blessed and thankful to be a part of that team and be a part of that win. Uh, and, you know, I, I definitely look at it often uh, in terms of just watching this film and breaking down and seeing what good things have come out of that and what bad things have come out of that as well. So um, try not to watch it too much as TV and, and, and try to glorify it as much as possible. But uh, I definitely do get to watch it from time to time. So. 
How, uh, how would you define a successful season, Dorian, for, for you and for, for the team this year? What does that look like? Yeah, one phrase, 7-0, and uh, taking it week by week, uh, knocking them down each week and, and going 7-0 and and getting that Pac-12 championship. And I'm sure Coach would, would coach you up on saying to get to 7-0, and that means 1-0 seven times, right? Exactly. Yeah. So I, I got to ask you before you go, uh, if you wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit about your artistic side. I understand you design your own tattoos. Your, your ink is beautiful. Uh, what else? Uh, I mean, obviously, you got to have something in your life besides football. It's nice to know that art is on that list. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, from a, a young age, I think I've always been kind of creative, thinking outside the box. And, um, you know, art is definitely one of those ways that I do that. I like to think of myself as an artist out there on the field, being a quarterback, um, you know, trying to find creative ways to get the ball out to guys and stuff like that. So um, I'm definitely a big art guy and I love to paint, draw. I draw all my tattoos. Um, and so that's definitely one of the things I, I like to do as a hobby. Do you have a favorite tat or, or are they like your children? Like every single one of them, you got to love the same. <laughs> Yeah, I try to think of them all as, you know, they're all equally uh, meaningful to me. But, you know, definitely the one of my parents right here on my chest and um, getting to see them every day. So I love that. All right. Hey, go get them on November 7th and every other Friday and Saturday that, that you guys are playing. Thanks. Yes, sir. Go Bruins. All right. So now we transition to Dimitri Felton. We talked to DTR. We got to get uh, the, the second half of that equation going here. What a dynamic duo they have been. And uh, first of all, Dimitri, I, I got to ask you, why are you so excited about the potential for this 2020 season? Uh, I'm excited for it because I feel like um, the work that this team has put in is just going to come to fruition. You know, we worked so hard um, having things shut down. We found ways to keep on working and getting better. And so I just feel like because of that, because of the passion that this team has and how much talent we have, um, it's just, you know, there's so many possibilities for what's going to happen this year. And I feel like it's going to end very well. One of the things I love about your game is it's so tough to put you in a box and figure you out. I mean, just at the moment, we think you're some like scat back or maybe a slot receiver. Here you are showing up 15 pounds heavier, all muscle. Looks like you could actually run really well between the tackles now. Do you have thoughts about what you want to be or is it OK if you're all of that? For me, it's okay that I'm all of that. I want to do whatever is best for my team, whether it's being a slot receiver or being a running back. I feel like I can do all of those at a very high level. So uh, whichever my coach seems fit for me, I'll do that. What can you tell us about Joshua Kelly uh, that we might not already know? We're all keeping up with him, obviously, in the NFL. Do you stay in touch with him, too? Yes, I still uh, check in with him every time I uh, every time I can. I know he's a little busy, but um, I would say one thing that people don't know is that Josh Kelly carries a Bible with him everywhere he goes. And so <laughs> I just thought it was funny because one time me and him went to a party and he had a Bible still like on his shoulder, like he was carrying a football. And so he's a very uh, strong man of faith. And I think that was just something that I think people should know. That's a great one. And, you know, it's funny when you mentioned parties, that sounds like a hundred years ago that you know, we could all go to parties. <laughs> yeah. you know? yeah. So how, how are you adjusting? I mean, all you guys have to take personal responsibility now, right? To make sure that you're staying safe. And, you know, because if you infect yourself, you might infect the whole room and there goes a the game, there goes the season. So uh, how seriously are, are all of you guys taking that? We're taking it very seriously. We keep a mask on us wherever we go. Um, I I feel like the guys have taken, you know, the right steps and just making sure they don't hang out with anyone that isn't, you know, in the within the team. Like we all stay within our ecosystem. We all hang out together. We uh, go places together. Make sure we're wearing masks and we just try to social distance from other people who are not taking the same precautions as us. Last one for you. So far, anyway, what's the memorable moment or set of moments for you? I'm thinking Pullman last year, but maybe you've got a, another thought. Uh, definitely Pullman. That was a great experience. Uh, I don't think anything will ever top that. But um, another one of my favorite moments at UCLA was just um, my first year. I wasn't able to play due to a shoulder injury. So I was very excited to get back on the field 
And my first game, I had, I feel like I had a pretty good game against Hawaii. I had my first touchdown. And so that's something that I'll always for, remember. Well, more and more memorable moments coming up, my friend. Thanks so much for joining us. Go Bruins. Of course. Thank you so much. Have a good one. So the guy who will be excited to see the success of the DTRs and Demetric Feltons and everybody else that will contribute this year, the head coach of the Bruins, the third-year man with a glistening resume, Mr. Chip Kelly. We'll get to him in just a moment. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice, that's why. All my life, I've been grinding all my life. Look, I got everything I said I was going to get on my kid. In addition to that fact, I went legit. Now, according to the way that I'm positioned in this biz, it looks like I'm just going to keep on getting rich. Ah, chose story. All my life, been grinding all my life. Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price. Want a slice, got to roll the dice, that's why All my life, I've been grinding all my life Look, All my life, been grinding all my life Sacrifice, hustle, pay the price Want a slice, got to roll the dice, that's why All my life, I've been grinding all my life Look. Chip, so great to have you here. I need to know, first of all, what effect did the pandemic have for the coaching staff and, and what obstacles still remain? Um, we don't look at any obstacles. I think everybody knows in 2020, you have to be very nimble. Um, you got to adjust with the times. And I think the entire country, the entire world has been kind of turned around. Um, so we're, we don't lament about anything that's happened to us. Uh, we know people are going through a lot worse than us. So, you know, our thoughts and prayers are with them. And for us, it's just tell us tell us how we got to adapt and or, or what, what our restrictions are, and then we'll adjust off of that. So we did a lot of meetings. We weren't allowed to campus. So, so we just pivoted and, and worked with, worked on Zoom, you know, and our guys did a great job of working from home. Um, and then we continued to monitor the situation here on campus um, when we were allowed back. And, and we were out from probably March to the middle of September, I'm not allowed to return to campus, um, but we kept in constant contact with our players. Um, we had weekly, sometimes bi-weekly Zoom meetings by position, um, by team with our squad leaders um, and covered a myriad of things that we normally do in the off season. But we did it all via the way we're doing this right now. We did it via Zoom. It was just a, it was an adjustment. It wasn't in person, um, but I don't think we missed anything. You know, they, they say year three of any program is where the seeds really start to bloom and you hear there's just so much buy-in from these players obviously the coaching staff is completely bought in this is year three for you at ucla so are you are you excited to see if that theory is uh, is really the case i i don't think we've ever adhered to any theories um i think i mean if you did you would have never planned for a pandemic um mm -hmm. so i think the big thing for us is we take everything um you used to say take it day to day take it hour to hour you know and and uh, we adjust um you know, on the move here all the time. So we don't, it's not a, I think the pandemic has led everybody to kind of what my theory has always been is that the, the past has nothing to do with the future. You know, I think we control what we do right now in the moment and we just stay in the moment, not worry about what happened before we got here um, or in the last two years uh, and not really overly concerned. You know, if, if you're a mountain climber, you don't look at the top of the mountain, you just climb. And, that, and that's what our guys are doing right now. We're just climbing. One guy who looks like he's ready to really scale that mountain is your quarterback. What about the growth and the expectations for Dorian Thompson Robinson? I, I think Dorian's done a great job of, of as he's grown um, since we've been here, of really just staying in the moment. I think he's, you know, there, there's a calmness to him when he's out here operating. And I think the players thrive off of that right now. Um, he's done a really good job of just focusing on what can I do to get better today? Um, we're not talking – yeah, November, we're not talking December, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we weren't even playing. So I, I think it's, it's hard to get caught up in things that you don't control. What you can control is your mindset when you get to this building every day and, and the work that we put in and, and, you know, when your best players are your hardest workers, and that's an example that Dorian is, um, the rest of the players feed off it. So it's been really good to watch him um, grow and, and, and just see the the comfort level that he has with himself, which I think is, is vitally important for our whole team that, you know, because they all thrive off of him. You've already advised me not to linger in the past, but I'm, I'm going to yeah. make one very quick exception here. I mean, to me, it's like a flashlight in the fog, right? You don't want to look to the left or to the right. You want to look in that narrow beam that you're in right now. And I respect that, but I do wonder, I know fans are wondering how, how do you replace star 
position players like a Joshua Kelly, who's at the next level now and doing mm -hmm. great, Devin Asiasi, guys like that. Who are you looking at to, to step in and be a leader this year? Yeah, you know, throw Chris Barnes, who's playing really well for the Packers right now, or Darnay Holmes with the Giants. Um, but again, our philosophy is we're, we're not concerned with what we don't have. Um, we had great relationships and we're excited for the success that those guys are having at the next level. Um, but one of the things, and we learned, I didn't make this up, but I learned a long time ago, comparison is the thief of joy, you know, and, and our guys, especially in 2020, and I think it's, they're learning it is just to live in the moment. And we're not concerned um, with who isn't here. Um, we're just excited about the guys that are here. And we've got a lot of returning players that, that contributed to a lot of things. You know, Kyle Phillips on offense, Dimitri Felton on offense, Chase Coda on offense, you know, uh, some of our offensive linemen are really uh, exciting for us right now. Sean Ryan is playing really, really well at a very high level right now. Excited about that group up front. And then on the defensive side of the ball, we've got a bunch of guys that are just flying around. So we're excited um, about having a good Thursday, which is what we're on right now. Um, and, and if we continue to grow the way we're going to grow, then I think people will be happy with what they see when we get to November. Glad you're excited. We're excited too. Go get them. Go Bruins. We'll see you soon. All right, thank you. Go Bruins. Almost at the end of our evening together. Again, thanks everybody for being part of this. Really do appreciate it. One last guest to bring on, someone all of you have gotten to know quite well. And thank goodness he's around to help with the transition from Dan Guerrero to Martin Jarman, a man who knows the lay of the land and just bleeds these colors as you do as well. Now in his 10th year as the Senior Associate Athletic Director at UCLA, Josh Rebholz. Hey Bruin family, it's Josh Revholt, Senior Associate Athletic Director, and I just want to say thank you on behalf of all of us at UCLA for being with us tonight. Our first virtual kickoff dinner. Uh, obviously, you know that we're usually together this time of year at Royce Quad, having a great dinner, having a great night, having a lot of fun, laughs with each other. We sure do miss you, but we're excited that you were here with us tonight, and we appreciate that. We also thank you for all that you do for UCLA, uh, whether a letter winner, a grant and aid donor, a then now forever donor, a uh, Wooden Athletic Fund member, or if you supported the Bruins Support Program. We just sincerely thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all that you do for UCLA. And what a year it's gonna be. We're really excited about this season. We get going here in a few days at Colorado. We know you're gonna be rooting for us. Uh, we appreciate that support. Uh, it makes a difference for us, and it certainly makes uh, all these young men uh, work a little bit harder when they know that you're, that you're cheering them on. So just wanna say thank you again on behalf of all of us. Hope you had a great evening. Uh, we look forward to seeing you soon, and uh, let's have a great year. Go Bruins. Thanks, everybody. Well, thanks to Josh Rebels. Thanks to everybody who participated, all the players, all the coaches, but most of all, all of you who have been so patient and so giving. We hope you'll continue your, your patience and your support and can't wait till we actually have a kickoff for real, not virtually, but for real, on November 7th in Boulder, Colorado. That is game one, and we'll have the action for you, of course, on the Bruins Radio Network. For many people behind the scenes, and uh, well, for my partners, Matt and Wayne as well, I'm Josh Lewin. Thanks so much. Go Bruins. Good night.